Welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated, I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. And joining me like he always does for the THI Football Preview Podcast, THI publisher Andrew Jones. Andrew, we got another exciting show coming up. We've got Dina coming on for her Dina's Dandy segment. We've also got Brett Friedlander, good friend of ours, coming on to talk about the NC State, Carolina's opponent this weekend, excuse me, in NC State. And then we'll wrap it up at the end talking to AJ about some of his favorite and most memorable moments from the UNC NC State rivalry over the years. AJ, first thing I want to talk about, though, Carolina obviously taking on NC State this weekend in Chapel Hill. Noon kickoff for the teams. Carolina is in the process this week of dealing with a lot of uh, self-inflicted adversity, which was a major theme from their loss at Florida State. How big of a focus is that for the Tar Heels? I know it's a rivalry game, but I think that's one of, no matter who Carolina will be playing this weekend, I think that's one of the things they're really trying to correct and really trying to get rid of going into this weekend's matchup. Well, if you take them at their word, and I do, that they dealt with that on Sunday. They cut the cord and they start moving ahead toward NC State. Mm -hmm. But as we who cover the team, you know, that stuff's going to linger for a while because a lot of things didn't go right. A lot of things didn't go right. You know, really, if you look at all four games, they've had issues in each of the four games. Oh, yeah. That, you know, with Syracuse, they didn't really move the ball very well. They had some pass pro issues and stretches. Boston College, they had a lot of pass pro issues, and they didn't move the ball great that game. And then Virginia Tech, they had the big third quarter where the Hokies blew up on them. And then, of course, last week, uh, the uh, FSU did a lot of wonderful things for them to win the game. The Tar Heels just imploded in a lot of ways. They were bad in all three phases of the game. They did march back. They did get some confidence com coming out of that game because they at least showed fight. I think that that fight is what carries over. The other stuff they dealt with it, the fight carries over, and they're going to need it this weekend. And I and, and in listening, to, uh, talking with Mac and Jay Bateman, Phil Longo, and some of the players, uh, I, I think that that edge is there this week, and it really would be it would be there no matter who they're playing. I think the fact that it's NC State will help once they wake up Saturday morning or maybe before they go to bed Friday night. That's when they'll really kind of zero and you know we got to get these guys. You know, that red team is the one we're really supposed to go after. Mm -hmm. But I think right now they're in the process of just trying to get better, trying to improve a couple of elements of the game. Sam talked about getting better, not having drops. Uh, Phil Longo talked about, and Brian Anderson, about getting better with their pass protection. And Brian said it's all about executing and fundamentals and that kind of stuff. So they're working on that. The defensive line, stop on the run, linebacker issues. Chad Strat has seven tackles in the last two games. So there's plenty of stuff on the table for them to worry about focusing on fixing while having cut the cord to FSU and not being totally dialed into the fact that it's NC State this week. There's still enough time for them to really get into the anti-NC State mojo. Okay. But that's a long bridge in between, and it's a cluttered bridge because there's a lot of things for this team to fix. For sure. And to focus on the offense for a little bit, AJ. Um, Florida State, was a, it was a bad first half from Carolina offensively. It took them a really long time to get going. It, but that's kind of been a theme for this offense as a whole throughout the majority of the season. You look at the Syracuse game. I mean, Carolina didn't really do much in the first half, big second half, uh, BC game a little bit, Virginia Tech even. Every game this year, it's took maybe besides the Virginia Tech game in some ways, it's took Carolina a little bit of time to get going. How much is that a focus for Carolina going into this game of, okay, we need to start off fast and maintain it and building off of that? What do you think Carolina needs to do offensively in order to be successful this weekend against State? Well, they scored touchdowns mm -hmm. in their first three games on their first possession, and then – kind of wobbled. So, well, not Virginia Tech, they didn't wobble, but they wobbled in the first two. Mm -hmm. Virginia Tech, they had issues in the third quarter, but part of that, they got snaps. Mm -hmm. Hokies had 25 offensive plays that quarter. So, I think getting off to a good start, closing strong, they've had issues at various parts of different games. It's just a matter of becoming more consistent. You're not going to score a touchdown in every possession. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Sam's not going to hit the bomb that people want to see. You know, Javante's not going to plow through the three hole and race 60 yards in the end zone. That's not, that's video game stuff. That's not real life. That, but the offense, I think, needs to minimize the three and outs. They had, they've had too many three, more three and outs this year than, than, than I expected that they would have. And you got to move the chains. And part of that is because at times they don't appear in sync in the passing game. 
And that's where the issues are. The running game has been phenomenal. You really can't ask for more from Michael Carter and Javante Williams or, or the blocking. It's not just the offensive line opening up massive holes, which they've done a lot. Garrett Walston's having an incredible year blocking as a tight end, and the receivers are blocking very well downfield. But, the, but I think the inconsistency of the offense can be traced to the inconsistency with the passing game, and pass protection is a lot of that. I just mentioned Garrett, Garrett Walston. Well, they, they're, he's not running as many routes. They got to hold him back to block because they're having such difficult tight ends block and pass pro a lot. But it appears to me, and one of these days I'm gonna, I'm gonna tabulate. It, it appears to me he's staying back more than what you would want your tight end to stay back at pass block for. Mm -hmm. Switching the focus over to the defensive side of the ball, AJ Carolina's let up what 76 points in the last two games combined. I mean, it's not been a, it's been a two pretty subpar defensive performances, but. You also look at that Florida State game in the second half. I mean, Carolina didn't let them score. Going into this game against State, is it a fact for this defense of just trying to build off that second half performance to get Florida State and carry that into the Wolfpack game with the Wolfpack? And kind of building off what I said on the first question about the offense, what do you think Carolina needs to do defensively to be successful against the, the, the Wolfpack on Saturday? They didn't give up points, and that's the most in, important stat. But they did give up 6.8 yards of rush on 21 runs. Mm -hmm. FSU didn't pass much in the second half. They didn't have much. They're two for six. Uh, and I don't think FSU took the foot off the gas. I just think that they believe that their vehicle to winning was running at a defensive line, defensive interior that is struggling some. And also, because the defensive linemen are not occupying multiple blockers, you know, Chaz is getting shaded and, and hit a little bit more. There's a little more in his way. Same with Jeremiah Gemmel. Um, they're not roaming as freely as they did a year ago out there. And that's affected their productivity. And also, it, you know, what were once maybe four-yard runs are now five-and-a-half and, and six-yard runs. And, mm -hmm. and that's something that needs to be fixed. But, you know, what's the, the, the question is how do you fix it? Yes. The, they have three guys – that they're fairly comfortable playing in the interior defensive line. One of them is Julio Taylor, and he played 10 snaps at FSU. Now, granted, FSU only ran like 55 or 56 plays, so they weren't running a ton of snaps, but they need a fourth and a fifth guy, and hasn't been Zach Gill yet. Miles Murphy's still fresh. He only played three snaps. Kevin Hester played seven. But I, I think that's an area that NC State's going to want to exploit because the running game's pretty, been pretty solid for the fact they got a really good offensive line. And a big offensive line. I think that's where the states could try to establish this game. So Carolina's linebackers have to be more physical. Uh, the problems they had in Tallahassee, G Jeremiah Gemmel said they had issues with the fits, the run fits on defense. They got to be better. Uh, that was a point of emphasis going into Virginia Tech. And they did, I mean, I don't even think they did very well in that one either. They've given up 501 rushing yards the last two weeks. Yeah, which is surprising. So, they're not getting making their fits. They're they're not winning at the at the at the point of contact, and because of that, and, and even some of the guys said that some guys are trying to do too much. And when they do that, they're trying to make plays that maybe somebody else should make. So it looks like all those missed tackles or more reaches. It's um, when your defense doesn't do well. One of the dangers is guys try to do somebody else's job. Yeah, and then that means that they're not doing their job, and everything falls apart. And that's what we've seen. Jeremiah said, well, what was the difference in the second half? Well, guys kind of did their, their jobs a little bit more. They didn't tweak anything. Bateman just said, "Guy, do your job a little more. So that's a point of emphasis this week. And just there's 11 dudes out there. Each one of them needs to just handle their assignment, their responsibility. And if each one of them does it, then you're going to have performances that are more like what they did against Syracuse and BC. AJ, last thing I want to talk to you before we move on to the next segment. Um, Mac Brown's talked a lot about it, but Carolina really hasn't had a game this year where they've put together a complete game. Special teams plays well, offense plays well, defense plays well, and they end up winning the game. Obviously, winning against NC State, winning against anybody is important. How much more important is it for this team, sooner rather than later, to put together, maybe not a perfect game, but to have kind of all three phases play well for, for, for you know, one game and then – whatever happens on the scoreboard happens. But how important is that for Carolina? I, I think that that's kind of been a bigger issue because of how quickly they moved up the rankings. So people expect, yeah. well, you're number eight or you're number five, or you're going to roll out of there. We're going to check all these positive boxes on this team. And Max said, look, we weren't the number five team in the country. And he's right. Mm -hmm. We weren't the number eight team. 
they're, they're a very much a growing program and a growing team. They've got a lot of things they need to fix. Mm-hmm. They've played 16 quarters this year. I would say that they've played really well in six of them. They've mm-hmm. played really poorly in six of them. And they've been, you know, so-so to average decent in four. It's enough to be three and one. Uh, and, and when they've been really good, they've been incredible. So you oh, can yeah. see where that ceiling is. Mm-hmm. The, the key is to fix the stuff that keeps you from those other six. And if you can be great in one quarter and average to pretty good in the other three every game, you're going to win almost every time you step on the field. So uh, they've got to clean stuff up in order to play well in the same game in all three phases. And there's a lot of youth on this team. There's a lot of inexperience. That defense is not the same composition that people saw when, when fall camp started, they're missing some important players. Mm-hmm. It's not excuses when, you, when you're the coaching staff, when you're the players. But when we evaluate and look at what's going on, it clearly is. And, and so in a month from now, they're going to be better because they're going to be more experienced. But I think it, we could see all three phases in this game. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that all – I think the offense and defense can play well in the same game. The special teams has had really big mistakes in each of the last three games. Uh-huh. And, and, and they were off the charts bad in Tallahassee. So I can't tell you that you, sh- you can expect all three phases in the same game anytime soon because until the special teams has that great game, it's pretty hard to expect a good game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, special Maybe team. an average game you can expect because they're – so it's a it's a good football team, a talented football team with a with a very good coaching staff, and it's a power five team. So you should always be at least average on special teams. Oh, they haven't no. been average yet. No, they have not been average, and it's it's cost Carolina a few games this season, particularly last week. Well, that's going to do it for us in this segment, AJ. But got one of my favorite segments coming up next. I'm not sure if you want to take this one over and intro us into it. It's up no. to you, AJ. I'm, I'm going to put that ball on your court, but if not, I, I no, can. I it. shot an air ball last week on that one, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm swing pass over to the over the perimeter to you over on the wing. Let me take the shot for the win. I, I, I appreciate the assist, AJ. Well, next up, got one of my favorite segments on our THI Football Preview Podcast, Dina's Dandies. Hey, guys. Welcome to this edition of Dina's Dandies, the Wolf Pack. Lots of recruiting battles between the Tar Heels and the Wolf Pack. So I'm going to break it down. Lots of North Carolina kids on the roster that we're going to discuss. I'm going to start on the defensive side of the ball. And the first one I'm going to talk to, lots of UNC fans know the name. Linebacker Peyton Wilson, the former UNC commit out of Orange High School. He committed to Coach Fedora and was committed for for quite some time and then decided that he was going to decommit, and now he's playing for the Wolfpack, having a great year for NC State, one of the leading tacklers in the ACC. His teammate there at linebacker, Drake Thomas, from Raleigh there at Heritage High School, local product, he, he was a great linebacker there for the, the Huskies. And then I'm just going to stick on the defensive line, Aleem McNeil from Sanderson High School in Raleigh. Yeah, they really dominated Raleigh in those years because Coach Dorn, he racked up a lot of a re- big recruiting wins that year. So Aleem McNeil having – Possibly a, a, a all ACC top year so far. So he's another kid that you need to keep your eyes on. And now I'm going to switch to the offensive side of the ball. When you talk about NC State, you look at their running back combo, two North Carolina kids that I want to mention, Zonovan Knight out of Southern Nash High School and Ricky Person out of Heritage High School in Raleigh. They got their own little version, uh, dynamic duo at a rushing tack. And then you throw in wide receiver, Emika Mizi out of Marvin Ridge High School, Union County, the same territory, uh, Sam Howell, Will Shipley, big recruit. Union County's becoming a very, very fertile recruiting grounds for, for the state of North Carolina. Last one on the offensive side is the anchor. Grant Gibson, the center from Mallard Creek High School. Everybody knows what kind of talent comes year in and year out of Mallard Creek. So Gibson is the 
the big anchor of the wolf pack line. And then my final North Carolina kid that I'm gonna talk about for the wolf pack, Chris Dunn, the kicker out of North Davison, outstanding kicker. He did it in high school and he's doing it for the wolf pack. Check back next week and for the next edition of Dina's Dandies. Thank you. Great stuff from Dina as always during her weekly Dina's Dandies segment. Dina, the first thing I want to talk to you about, you, you touched on Peyton Wilson in, in that segment. Um, what do you remember about his recruitment? I know he was obviously a guy that was committed to Carolina at one point and then flipped to NC State, but what are kind of your memories for that recruitment? And did you see that, that uh, flip coming or was that a shock to you? Well, he was right in the backyard, right? Orange County, Hillsborough, uh, multi athletic person, wrestling state champion. So he was basically one of the signature commits in Coach Fedora's class, but just it just started. I just got a vibe that he started not being so much uh, open to me when I would talk to him. Uh, of course, I, I covered his commitment when mm -hmm. I was down there at Orange High School when he committed and he was, he was all, always open and, and talking and everything, getting updates on him. But uh, just something something happened, and, um, you know, he, he eventually decommitted and uh, committed to NC State. You want to touch something on that happened. at all, Peter? Yeah, something happened all right. I mean, he realized he didn't want to go to Carolina, and he was pretty expressive about it, pretty open about it. And, I, you know, I applaud him. If that's what he wanted to say, I, I think a lot of Carolina fans took offense to it. But uh, he, for him, he wasn't wrong. For some other players, that may not that it wasn't something that they shared. If for him, he needed wanted needed to be at NC State, and he's doing real well there. I mean, he's come, he, he's had a couple of injuries. He's had to fight through. Um, he's an incredibly vibrant player on the field. It is impossible to look at the field when State's on defense and not immediately see where Peyton Wilson is. Uh, he's, he's, even when he's not directly in the play, you just still see him on the field. And he's, he's overcome a couple of those bad injuries. And the fight and, and the, the kind of the grittiness that we saw with how he handled his decommitment and flipping the state is the player you see on the field. And he, I think he, he leads the ACC in, in tackles uh, per game. So um, he's turned into a hell of a player. And Carolina could use him. Carolina would love to have a guy like him, and, and they don't. And I think that the programs are different now. Certainly Carolina's a little bit of a different program than it was a couple of years ago, but he wasn't the only kid that flipped from Carolina. He wasn't the only kid that was a little bit turned off during those last couple of years of the previous regime. And I'm not dumping on the regime. It's just a reality. Mm -hmm. AJ, you kind of touched on it a little bit there, but you talked about, you know, the last couple of years of Fedora, some of those guys that are currently on the state roster either – weren't priority targets for Carolina or were recruited by Carolina at one point and then Carolina just kind of stopped recruiting them. Is it safe to say that, that – and, and do you expect that to kind of have a little bit of – give those players a little bit of an edge? Because I think we even saw that last year with Peyton Wilson in that robbery game. There were some instances where you could see that it looked like he kind of had a point to prove when he was out there playing against the Tar Heels. Well, this isn't a Peyton Wilson show, but he plays like that every week. Yeah. And that's one of the things that if you're a fan of NC State, you would love having a guy like that on the field. If he played for Carolina and did those very same things, UNC fans would love him. <laughs> so he's the kind of guy that you love to have on your team, you hate him when he's on another team. And for, if I'm a coach, you want as many of those dudes as you can get on the field. So, yeah, I think that there's an edge factor. There's always been an edge factor. But with the, the kids that Dina mentioned, I mean, those are some really, really good players that the Fedora staff either under-recruited, didn't really recruit, or did something in the process that, that just made State more appealing. And you got to credit Dave Doran as well. Uh, Doran had Fedora's number there for a couple of years. Totally owned him in State. And, um, you know, this, it wasn't just Carolina did things wrong. State did a lot of things right. Now, some of that's flipped in, in the last 23 months. But a big part of the important players that are going to come into Keenan Stadium this weekend were guys at Carolina under Fedora probably didn't make enough of the right effort to bring on board. And the one that they did was the loudest about flipping and becoming a, a Wolfpack uh, star. I mean, he's, Peyton's becoming a star over there. Well, Andrew, you know, give, 
like you said, give Coach Dorn credit. He sold the program. When we looked at the opening day rosters on NFL trying to find UNC players, every every list had had a All state over. player and yeah, some everywhere. teams had multiple players. So give him credit. He 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 sold the program. Uh, that one year they they really did well in state. They dominated in, in the state. So yeah, I agree. And I think five years from now, seven years from now. I don't know what, what's going to happen with Dorian State. A lot of people said he, he started the year in a warm seat, maybe even a hot seat, and at 4-1 and one right now, he's looking pretty good. But Mac, I think, has changed the course of in-state recruiting, obviously, with the kind of classes he's brought in. The current freshman class had three kids that flipped from NC State. So you're going to see more of an even balance or maybe even more UNC kids on NFL rosters in five or seven years from now than NC State kids. But all credit goes to what that staff over there has done. Uh, they have they have created a brand for themselves. They've sold it to kids and guys like Drake Thomas and Peyton Wilson and Grant Gibson and Mecky Akizi, they embrace, and Ricky Pierce, they, they embrace that brand. They embrace that culture. It's working out pretty well for State. State's won three in a row in Chapel Hill. They're seven and three against the Tar Heels in Chapel Hill this century. It's working out pretty work for Tom O'Brien, and it's certainly working for uh, Dave Doran. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Virginia Tech a little bit when we did our preview pod and you're listing off this stuff, you know, Virginia Tech has dominated Carolina over the last 10 years or so. It's kind of been the same with State in a lot of ways, too. But that's going to do it for this segment. Next up, we've got our good friend Brett Friedlander coming on here from the NC State Sports Illustrated site to talk a little bit about the Wolfpack. So here's Brett. All right, right now let's go ahead and welcome in our special guest. He covers NC State, really covers everything, but he also focuses a lot on NC State on the Sports Illustrated Maven site. Uh, all Wolfpack, Maven, Haven, BrettFriedlander.com is what it should be called. Our very, <laughs> very good friend, one of the best in the business, Brett Friedlander. Welcome to the preview pod, Brett. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure being on with you, AJ. And um, hopefully we can, we can do this without going over, because usually when we get it together, this thing goes about 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the longest, by the way, we've gone without seeing each other since like the 90, late 90s. I know. It's pretty, wonderful. It's pretty wild. Is, this pandemic has really been a, a killer for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah it has. And is what it was a killer for North Carolina the other night was the first half against Florida State. On the other side, NC State looked awful in Blacksburg, found something, and I, I think it's more than just Devin Leary, and the Wolfpack string together three wins in a row. Aside from Devin Leary, what has been – the, maybe the next biggest reason why NC State has turned it on, they're ranked, and the Dave Dorn hot seat, warm seat, uh, warm seat conversation stuff is completely off the radar. The biggest difference has been defense. Uh, they got torched for 42 in the first game against Wake Forest that they won, and then uh, Virginia Tech hung 45 on them the next week. They couldn't stop the run. They couldn't stop anything at, the, at that point. Uh, the last two weeks, they have forced seven turnovers. Um, I don't think it has everything to do with the new takeaway bone that they've got that they're uh, that they're giving away. Uh, it's basically a big piece of rawhide that they've painted red, and um, whenever somebody gets a turnover, they get to sign their name on it. But uh, uh, may maybe it is. But against Virginia and against Duke, uh, six interceptions, seven turnovers, and I think that's been the biggest difference because last week against Duke, the the Wolfpack had a very similar. Um, uh, first half to the one that the Tar Heels had at Florida State. They had a punt blocked for a touchdown. They committed two turnovers. They, they did everything they possibly could. Six, uh, eight, excuse me, eight penalties for 106 yards. I mean, they could have been down 31 to seven. The reason they weren't is because the defense turned the ball over twice and got a bunch of three and outs and didn't let Virginia get too far ahead. And instead of being down huge where they couldn't come back, they were only down, I believe it was 20 to uh, 14 or, or 23 to 14 at halftime. And so it was still very doable. So the defense in particular, and Peyton Wilson, Isaiah Moore, uh, Vi Jones, uh, Drake Thomas, the linebacking core in particular, have been a very big reason for the turnaround. So transition question here before I ask you about Bailey Hogman. Has that infused the team's mojo more than what Leary was doing or – and, and if the answer is yes, I would assume that that will just naturally carry into Keenan Stadium this week. Yes, and it has carried over to the whole – because the, the, the offense no longer has to carry them. I mean, the offense had a terrible game against Virginia. 
but it was the defense that won that game. I mean, you had a big fat guy touchdown when Aline McNeil uh, batted, batted a ball up in the air and, and ended up scoring a touchdown, a 325-pound touchdown. Uh, so, you know, it, it's now complementary football as opposed to just one side of the ball uh, carrying the load. And I think that's really kind of made this team a little bit more together, a little bit more confident. And they feel like, you know, they're ranked 23rd in the nation now, and they feel like they deserve that. Now to Hawkman very quickly, um, Leary's out. It's a terrible injury. It's such a horrible to see stuff like that. But Hawkman has experience. Uh, he struggled a little bit. That's why Leary ended up taking over, although I think a lot of people thought that that was, that was going to be the case eventually anyway. So what does Hawkman do well that gives State a chance to win this game? Hawkman distributes the ball to his playmakers. Uh, the, he doesn't have as strong of an arm as Devin Leary, and that's not even close. So he's not going to hurt you downfield the way uh, Devin Leary uh, did. And that was one of the reasons why he got yanked last year after two starts, because they weren't getting anything downfield and uh, you know, defenses were loading up on him. The difference this year, though, is they've got a, a much stronger running game. They've got an offensive line in front of him who's, that's healthy and experienced. And so he's going to get a lot more time to throw the ball. And the other thing is that Tim Beck, the new offensive coordinator, is really very good at patterning, uh, you know, a game plan based on the, you know, the, the abilities of his quarterback. Uh, the first game against Wake Forest, Hockman completed his first 13 passes. And one of the reasons is because he got, you know, he, Beck got him into a rhythm. He's, they started out with a little, you know, short passing game to receivers and slants over the middle. And then when the defense adjusted, you know, it, it, it opened up some of the flanks and, you know, he started hitting wide receivers, uh, you know, not necessarily 30 yards downfield, but I mean, for, for longer gains. And then you throw in a, a running a game with, you know, with Bam Knight and Ricky Person Jr. And then as a change of pace on third down, Jordan Houston, it's a diverse offense that defenses really can't load up on. And so you have to kind of keep, you know, keep honest. So the fact that he's got so many weapons, that's Bailey Hockman's strength that is that he doesn't try to do anything, uh, you know, that he really isn't capable of doing. The big bugaboo against him, though, is that his decision making is sometimes suspect. And in the Wake Forest game, State was really in control until he threw a pick six. And all of a sudden that game got close. And so he's prone to making mistakes. So if you can put some pressure on him, then that's the way to do it because he's liable to throw it to the wrong team. <laughs> Brett, you talked about the offensive coordinator being, you know, able to create like a really positive game plan around whichever quarterback is going out there. With Hawkman coming in and Leary being out, is there going to be more of a reliance now on the likes of Ricky Person, on the likes of Zonovan Knight, do you expect State to kind of rely on that a little bit more? Or do you think they'll also let Hockman kind of air it out as well? I think he's going to let Hockman air it out as well because, you know, he, he believes in a balanced offense. And to be honest with you, I think the success of the running game of State is because they've been able to throw the ball. When, when Leary came in, you can't put that eighth man in the box. You, you, you've got to be uh, at least, you know, recognize that they can throw the ball. And so I, I think one kind of goes with the other. Um, that having been said, I think you'll see a little bit more of a reliance on the running game. And you might see them, you know, try to establish it early to, uh, to allow Hockman to, uh, to, to get some confidence going. But the fact is that he's played and he's won games before. So, uh, you know, he, he shouldn't be all that nervous. And he shouldn't be, you know, a deer in headlights. I mean, this guy has – he started a couple of games last year. He was at Florida State before he ended up at UNC. So, I mean, excuse me, at NC State. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is not his first cookout. So, I, I, I think you'll see a little bit more of a reliance on the running game, but not, you know, selling out to it. Unless they have success early. Carolina's given up 500 million yards on the ground in the last two games. <laughs> so if they have success early, they may have to worry about Bailey Hawkman. Yes. <laughs> On the other side of the ball, uh, I know a lot of Carolina fans just don't like Peyton Wilson. Uh, they don't like what he I said after he, he, after he flipped. And then maybe some of the th things he does in the field. But I would imagine NC State fans absolutely love him. They do. The kind of guy, when he plays for you, you know that when you're in the foxhole with that guy, he's got your back 100% of the time. I think this is one of the great stories in the ACC this year, the way he's come back playing very, very well, averaging 11 tackles a game. What is it about him that has, that has enabled him to fully overcome those knee injuries and play like one of the better defensive players in the league this year? Well, we had a Zoom conference with some players earlier today, and uh, offensive lineman Joe Sculthorpe was asked that very question about Peyton Wilson, and he said it's because Wilson has one speed, 
and that's on. And, you know, in practice and every snap, this guy is going and playing like it's the last snap of his life. And, and the intensity that he brings carries over. The Virginia Tech game, he missed because he was in contact tracing. And they had a very flat performance, especially on that side of the ball. And one of the reasons is because he wasn't there with his intensity. And it, it just spills over to the entire roster. And he's got a mean streak to him. And sometimes it boils over. He got a personal foul penalty um, last week against Duke because he hit a guy after the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the whistle. Against Wake Forest, he got one because he body slammed the guy after, you know, a running back came across the middle, caught a ball. He basically picked him up and you know, had a two-point takedown. Uh, but uh, he, he's, he's a bulldog. And if you watch the um, – and I hate to do this because I asked you not to bring up baseball. But if you ask – if you watch game five uh, of – this could be game four of the National League Championship Series, his brother Bryce – pitched six, you know, strong innings for the Atlanta Braves, and he was a bulldog out on the mound. Yeah. It's the same kind of attitude. Uh, it's a no, take no prisoners. I've got only one speed, and it's full speed. And um, uh, he, he loves playing. He loves hitting. And the teammates, you know, he sets a standard that everybody has to live up to. Drake Thomas is also a local kid who uh, appears to be playing a lot better than he yeah. had previously in his career. He and Isaiah Moore and Wilson, they're three of the top 12 tacklers in the ACC. Thomas especially, because I think Carolina fans are much more familiar with him. Carolina recruited him pretty heavily for a while. Uh, what is different in his game now that appeared to be lacking before? And, and, more, and, and if you can hit on quickness and speed, if that, how much different that is. Because when I watched him before, I wondered if he was quick enough or fast enough to play a lot of snaps at this level. But his results suggest – and some of the film I've watched suggests that he's a different player now. Andrew, I think it's not necessarily improving his speed and quickness. I think it's improving his anticipation, his um, understanding of what's going to happen. And I think he's in better places uh, to make plays. And so he's not playing catch up. He's not a step and a half behind now. He's right there making those plays. You know, he reminds me a lot of Luke Keekley because the ball seems to find him. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he seems to be around it all the time. And I think it's because of his anticipation. I think it's because of his understanding of the game. I think it's better. And I think the, you know, the confidence of you know, getting playing time and being out there all the time instead of every, you know, every second or third series, I think that's helped a lot. And also on that linebacking court, don't forget the fourth linebacker, Levi Jones. Uh, he's a, um, he's a, a, a transfer from Southern Cal. His father, Robert, played for the Dallas Cowboys and played in three Super Bowls. His brother, um, Zay, uh, was a wide receiver at, um, at East Carolina and is the all-time single-season NCAA leader uh, in, in, in catches and plays for the Raiders. So he's got, you know, good bloodlines. This linebacking core is as deep and as talented as any in the ACC. And they need to be because the secondary is really banged up, um, especially uh, at safety. They've already lost two guys for the season, Rakeem Ashford and um, uh, Khalid Moore. Um, uh, and uh, excuse me, Khalid Martin. And uh, last week, Tanner Engel, their co-captain and, and, and leader out there, uh, pulled a hamstring. And I'm guessing he isn't going to play because the way he hobbled off the field and, and was in such pain, I can't imagine he'd be back. So they're playing with a true freshman converted quarterback as their starting safety in Devin Boykin and a one-time walk-on who has only played uh, special teams until playing 68 snaps last week in Isaac Duffy. You know, that's their strong safety. And so, uh, you know, if, if their linebacking court and their defensive line doesn't play, you know, all out and really give a big performance, uh, there are big plays to be had uh, for Sam Howell. And I'm sure they're going to be picking on those guys every time they get a chance. Brett, that's a perfect segue. I'm going to go ahead and pass uh, points to the passer on that one. So what I wanted to ask you about in terms of the secondary, um, yeah, obviously it's a pretty banged up group right now. Um, is it safe to say that that's, you know, NC State's weakest, I guess, position group on the team? And do you have any idea who's actually going to suit up for them this weekend? Or is it still kind of up in the air? It's still pretty up in the air. They're still – they're pretty good at, at corner. Uh, you know, Malik Dunlap, who was a, a train wreck last year, is playing great this year. He's 6'4". Uh, it's tough to get the ball over him. And on the other side, they're playing a red shirt freshman named Shaheem Battle, who's had a, you know, he's off to a great start. So they're pretty solid with their starting corners. Uh, at nickel, uh, Tyler Baker Williams is an experienced guy, and he's backed up by um, Joshua Pierre Lewis, who's a true freshman, 
But because Tyler Baker Williams was um, uh, on contact tracing for the past two weeks up until the Duke game, um, uh, he had to play a lot. So they're pretty, pretty good at those three positions. It's the safety position that's really uh, a problem. And uh, at this point, we don't know who's going to suit up. We don't know how bad things are going to be. I mean, like, like I said, they're playing a guy who had done nothing but play special teams until he played 68 snaps last week against Duke. Uh, he's probably going to start. And uh, they've moved a, a wide receiver, Max Fisher, over to safety uh, because they just are that thin. And so uh, it, it's going to be a question. And, again, if they don't put pressure on Sam Howell, he will, he will, he will just tear these guys apart especially down the field. Last question, Brett. Uh, the disposition at UNC and NC State, I, 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 they could be different going into this game. You mean, the hand in the blue collar? Me? You mean the hand in the dirt, blue collar attitude? <laughs> well, I mean, Carolina was asked a couple questions about the blue collar mentality of State, and, and Sam was even <clears throat> talking about uh, State's defense, and he said, you know, that they just have a tougher mentality uh, than, than, than they had last year as an example. Yes. But Carolina is approaching this game. Yeah, it's a rivalry. We embrace the rivalry. It's an in-state game. We want to win in-state games. But they're, A, cutting the cord to a terrible performance, by and large, a self-inflicted performance in Tallahassee. But they're very big picture-minded. You know, this is just one of 11 games this season. They're not going to put too much into it because they're, they're learning to try to treat every game with maximum importance. How is NC State looking at this game? What is their disposition about the rivalry, about the game this week, especially with how they're playing, and maybe with an idea about a little memory about what happened last November at Carter Finley? Yeah, I, they're taking a very similar attitude. Uh, Doran on Monday and the players today, Skullthorpe and uh, Ameka Amizi, both downplayed this, saying, yes, we know it's a big game, but we can't treat it like that because if we do, then you know, we're going to be putting a lot more pressure on ourselves and we're going to, we're going to make this a lot more difficult. Uh, one thing they've got is confidence. They, they, they're 3-0 and under Doran in Chapel Hill, uh, which is you know, hard to explain because they're 1-3 at home uh, against uh, the Tar Heels in, in, in Raleigh. Uh, but uh, they're very confident, and they understand that this is no fluke. Uh, it's not like they have been playing, t you know, easy teams, and, and they've gotten the benefit of the schedule. They've won at Pittsburgh. They've won at Virginia. Uh, and so, th you know, they know that they're a competent team, and they're going in very confident. And like you said, you know, we laugh about the whole uh, blue-collar thing and the hand in the dirt because it makes good, you know, uh, uh, fodder for, for message boards and stuff. But it really is – indicative of the way they play. This is a very hard-hitting, very no-nonsense team. This is not a finesse team. This is a smash-mouth team. Uh, and that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to go into Chapel Hill, and they're going to try to be more physical at the point of attack. And they're going to try to, you know, uh, out football the Tar Heels, if, you know, for, for a lack of a better term. Uh, and they've got the people to be able to do it this year because uh, last year, you know, they blamed it on injuries, and, and, and it was, a, you know, a valid excuse. But it just didn't seem that that team really kind of had that mentality. And this team, I think, does. And maybe it's because of what they went through last year. Outstanding stuff. You're the best, my friend. You know that. Anytime for you guys. It's good seeing you All again. Right. All yeah, right. He's, he's, Brett. Brett, he, he's Brett Freelander. We love him to death. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Anytime. Great stuff there from Brett Freelander. AJ, it's been a long time since I've seen Brett. We were talking all, about it off camera, but I was like, I don't think I've seen him since the ACC basketball championship. I used to see him like every day at, you know, Carolina games and road games and stuff like that. And it's just it's been a long time, man. It's been a weird year. <laughs> well, I've only seen you a handful of times. Yeah, that's a good seven point, months, So it's, we see each other like this. Mm -hmm. but yeah, Brett's fantastic. I love the work he does. He's so passionate about what he's so passionate about everything. Yeah. Everything that he likes and dislikes. <laughs> yeah. And that's what makes him such an interesting guy to, to be good friends with. Exactly. Brett's a great guy. It was good talking to him for a few minutes on that segment. But AJ, I want to talk to you a little bit, a bit before we round this podcast out about some of your favorite memories or most memorable moments from the NC State UNC rivalry. Obviously, you got the Geo punt. You got Russell Wilson in 2010. You got the, you know, the flat Larry Fedora's last year with the fight at the end of the game. I mean, <laughs> what are some of your most memorable moments, moments, excuse me, uh, from that rivalry? Uh, but, uh, this we could do a whole podcast on yeah, this. Thirty I'll, minutes on this. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of rattle them off real quickly, um, and and they go back into the '90s. I mean, they go before the '90s. I remember the the, the, the Donnie Thompson situation in the mid '90s in state, where two coaches kind of got into it after the game. 
That's a classic um, video. That's a classic video right there. With that. video. That's a great tackle, too. That, we got to put that on the board this week so people can watch it. That's tackle. hysterical. <laughs> you know, in 99, they played on a Thursday night in Charlotte, and both teams stunk. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, the, 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 the losing coach, Mike O'Kane, or he got fired because they lost that game. And and um, had Torbush law, I guess Torbush was going to get fired anyway, but then didn't, then didn't get fired, all that crazy stuff that went on. That was a memorable game because it was exciting. The two teams played with that typical rivalry passion that night, even though both of them really sucked. <laughs> uh, Philip Rivers t- taking State into Chapel Hill in 2000 and winning, that was sort of a, okay, the Chuck Amato era is here. We're moving forward. You guys cannot find what you had just a few years ago under Mac Brown, and you're stagnating. And um, – and they ended up firing Torbush that year anyway, but it didn't really work under Bunning. That was a memorable game because Philip was so good. Uh, I think 2003 and Carter Finley, Mike Mason, you know, crossing the midfield line during warmups repeatedly, just egging on the Wolfpack, and there was a little skirmish there, and it was it was all Mike Mason, Tar Heel, for those who don't know, it was all his fault. Um, goodness, the T.A. McClendon game in the next year, and it oh, was yeah. a fumble. I mean, I was covering that game for the Star News. It was a fumble. It was a great game. Madison Hedgecock was amazing that night. Chad Scott, the Tar Heels, played well occasionally that year, and that was one of the nights they did. And um, Russell Wilson, 2010, the two-yard Hail Mary. I covered a lot, did a lot of stuff when I was covering Russell Wilson uh, when, I was, when I was at Fox uh, and Star News. And um, he was a really interesting guy back then because he didn't, it was hard to get stuff from him, even after a game like that. The only two-yard Hail Mary in the history of college football, and I say that with quotation marks, he, he, after the game, you never would have known that Russell made that play. Yes. So uh, 2012, Geo, probably the – maybe the loudest I've ever heard Keenan when he returned it. I don't know what, to this day. I don't know why T.O.B. punted to him. Doesn't yeah, make any sense. Point. Shouldn't have punted to him. Nah. Uh, State wins that game if he doesn't, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah, I guess it was um, – oh, in 15 – Mm-hmm. Carolina put 35 on the board in the first quarter at State. Yeah. That Mark, that was Mark Weiss Williams' team. But Mitch Trubisky also threw a touchdown pass in the first quarter. And then the fight last year. And actually, I'll be honest with you, I know I'm rambling on here, but I, I, there have been times when State has come into Keenan and, and they have brought that lunch pail mentality, that muscle flexing approach, and have taken the Tar Heels at the line of scrimmage right out of the gate and established control of those games. A lot of the games here in recent years in Chapel Hill have not been as competitive as the final score might say. State's clearly been the better uh, team that has dictated how the game would go. And I think the Packs could try to do that this week. And I have a feeling we might be up for another memorable game this weekend because the Tar Heels are still trying to figure out a lot of stuff. And State kind of knows who they are, even though they're not going to have Devin Leary. They still got a lot of other parts. Mm-hmm. And that whole running game factor, they're going to want to you know, flex those muscles again and establish something. So we could be up for another one of these many memorable games, which has been a very fun series to cover. And I've covered both sides of it for a long time. And um, it's a treat. Yeah. You mentioned that geo game. I was actually at that game. I think that's the most memorable one for me. Obviously I don't have as long of a catalog as you have in terms of watching those games, but I know that, that geo one was it's definitely the loudest that I've ever seen Keenan Stadium. Obviously, I haven't been to, you know, a, a ton of games, but that was the loudest I've ever seen Keenan Stadium for sure. And I, also one of the big things, AJ, before I let you talk, is uh, one thing I'm going to miss about this weekend is just not having the fans there. I mean, you talk about not having them in general, but for a rivalry game like this, that's been one of my – that's one of the, the fun buzz. things to kind of follow is just the buzz in the stadium and kind of those robberies in the stands. I mean, that's going to be a big miss this weekend. Shout out. Eight years later, again, to Jones Angel for the Gio Bernard call. Oh, great. And that was when Jones was just transitioning, replacing Woody Durham. Mm-hmm. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Oh, and that's one of the great calls. I'm a, I'm a big broadcaster. I love old baseball radio broadcasts. Mm-hmm. And, and I can listen to, this, to great calls forever. And, you know, the, the Giants win the pennant stuff. And, uh, and, and Jones's call was phenomenal. And I think that that, that call and how it's – lived eight years later and will continue to live really helped him kind of fully take that Woody Durham seat. And uh, it, it, that adds to it. I mean, when you, when you could add something like that to it, uh, regardless of whoever you pull for, that makes the moment even more special. So when Carolina runs that, they run his call. Mm-hmm. 
and it's mm-hmm. perfect. It, it's mm-hmm. just one of the great moments. UNC football hasn't had, you know, a bevy of great, great, great moments that live live uh, uh, forever. Mm-hmm. That's one of them, and Jones's call is part of that moment. Yeah, no doubt before the game on Saturday, we'll be hearing that one played on the Jumbotron as Carolina's prepared to, to take the field. Obviously, won't be as many fans there, but there's no doubt we'll be hearing that Gio Bernard call from Jones Angel on Saturday. Well, that's going to do it for the THI Football Preview Podcast. Really enjoyed Dina's dandies coming on earlier. Also, Brett Freelander. It was great to talk to him as always. And as always, AJ, great having you on as well. And as always in the podcast, be sure to like it, be sure to share it, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.